Hello, everybody. Uh, it's it's great to be here. So my, my name is Siddharth Sinha. I represent uh, Niti Aayog of the Government of India. So Niti, Niti Aayog is the national institution for uh, transforming India. It's essentially India's uh, highest uh, policy making agency. And we also serve as an official think tank of the government. And we were specifically tasked to catalyze, you know, economic development in the country and, you know, bring together different ministries uh, towards the common goal of economic development, urban development, and so on and so forth. So we work with a range of different ministries, and we are headed by uh, the Prime Minister of India. Um, uh, just before I jump into the whole electric vehicles thing, I just I just wanted to, you know, kind of bring to your attention why, uh, you know, this has become such an important issue in India, because the transport sector contributes about 14% of total emissions, you know, in India, and this has more than tripled since, you know, 1990, if you see uh, you know, if you see the graph on your right, what it shows you is that between 2005 and 2015, the emissions have doubled. But if you look at this figure, you know, from 1990 onwards, this is actually sort of, uh, you know, tripled. And we're expecting that, you know, in the next 10 years, our total vehicle sales are actually going to go up to about, you know, 200 odd million. And what's really interesting is where EVs come into the picture is the fact that in India, roads carry 90% of, you know, of the modal share. So the average of freight and passengers would be about 90%. And out of these 14% contributions that come from the transport sector, 90% of them actually come from the road sector. And as is the case globally, India is witnessing rapid urbanization. Uh, you know, UN uh, data estimates say that, you know, Delhi might end up becoming one of the most populous cities. So what we also see is an urban sprawl. So, you know, the number of vehicles also increase. And given that road sector is such a big contributor, there's of course a need uh, to, you know, take measures towards uh, uh, you know, decarbonization. And of course, the, the, the recent uh, example, which everybody would be able to relate to, or the recent development rather, is COVID-19, because what it has done is that it has made people kind of shift away uh, from public transport, uh, you know, towards private modes of transport, which is, I mean, it's, it's a worrying trend, but it also brings, uh, you know, an opportunity. Uh, but, you know, just to say that electric vehicles are, of course, a very important part of, you know, of, of you know, ushering mobility, which is sort of clean and, you know, uh, you know, connected. But the government of India has also taken a number of other measures across sectors, because EV is one part of, you know, your ability to decarbonize transport sector. Uh, so, you know, we've come up with a vehicle strapping policy. We've come up with 11 committees to, you know, drive circular economy in various areas. Uh, we've come, uh, you know, we've, we have the FAME policy, which is specific to electric vehicles, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, you know, we have the national urban transport policy, which actually, you know, talks about creating a, which also talks about creating a, you know, unified metropolitan transport agency. And which is really important is because as Steffi was saying that we also need to talk about, you know, compact cities, urban sprawl, you know, mixed land use. And all of this is only possible when you're able to bring together different agencies, whether they're municipal or transport together. And, you know, that's why this policy is important. So, of course, uh, these are a lot of different initiatives, but I think, uh, I would use this to actually talk about the EV ecosystem in India. So what we see over here is that between 1981 and 2011, uh, there was a 77% increase in the population of India. But if you look at uh, the increase in the number of motor vehicles, uh, you know, they grew by almost 2,500%, which is, which is a huge number, right? Um, and so what we're trying to say now is that because this growth is so phenomenal, but despite this growth, if we look at the number of cars per million population, what we actually see is that while the US would have about 837 cars per 1,000 people, uh, you know, uh, in India, this is just about 22 cars per 1,000 population. And that's kind of interesting because, you know, then you actually have a huge opportunity to replace whatever addition is going to happen in the number of vehicles by, you know, mobility, which is kind of clean. And that's where electric vehicles sort of, uh, you know, sort of really come into, uh, you know, sort of really come into the picture. Uh, then what we see is, uh, if you look at the graph in yellow, this talks about the two-wheeler sales. Uh, and as you can see, they've, they've been constantly growing. So electric two-wheelers, by the way, the most popular forms of electric mobility in India, and we are seeing a constant upward growth. And in fact, it is projected by 2030, you might see about 24 million, uh, you know, registered, uh, you know, electric two wheelers uh, on, on, on the roads. And the kind of phenomenal growth that we are witnessing is that between 2015 and 2020, if you look at the uptake of electric mobility, and we are, uh, we are talking about 
the overall EV sales, which also includes four wheelers, two wheelers, we, we've seen you know a CAGR of 133 uh, percent, and you know that's that's really interesting. Now, what has what has really led to this is where our policy instruments come uh, you know into the picture. So we have something known as uh, you know the fame policy. So the fame policy stands for the faster adoption and manufacturing of electric and uh, you know hybrid vehicles, right? So fame to policy, there were two versions of this. This is the second version. It actually supports electrification of public and shared transportation. And it aims to subsidize about 7,000 electric buses, about 500,000 electric three-wheelers, about 55,000 four-wheelers, uh, you know, about a million two-wheelers and about 4,000, you know, charging stations, right? And this is the subsidy that actually gets passed on. This is actually the subsidy which is provided to the original equipment manufacturers. And that's important because they sort of then pass it on, uh, you know, to the end user or the consumer or the buyers of these electric vehicles. Uh, and if you look at what has been what has been availed out of the subsidies that we are actually providing to the manufacturers, about you know, the subsidy has already been availed out of the seven thousand available for e-buses for about six thousand two hundred sixty-five, uh, about fifteen thousand three-wheelers, uh, fifteen forty-four wheelers. Uh, that's really interesting. You know, if we look at the four wheelers there, we see that it's available for 55,000, but it's availed, it's been availed only for 1,540. And, and the reason for this is that this has been made available, uh, you know, only for uh, the four wheelers, which are going to be used in shared mobility or, you know, uh, uh, and, and I think that's what's not allowing private car manufacturers to avail this. So this is something that's been considered uh, and this will feed back into the probably the next time the policy is revised. Uh, and similarly, about 57,000 electric two-wheelers have also availed this. So, so FAME has two components. One, of course, is the subsidy component, and the other is something which is known as the phased manufacturing program. Now, what's also important for India as a country is to start manufacturing components which are used for electric vehicles. And so what we did was that we introduced something known as the phased manufacturing program, where we've actually incentivized the manufacture of low-value EV accessories by increasing the basic customs duty on these smaller components, which are actually being imported. So in that way, it gives a greater incentive for, you know, more number of local manufacturers to actually start uh, manufacturing them. And over time, we aim to, you know, go from the production of these low cost components to high cost components. And that is happening through something known as the production linked incentive schemes, which the government has recently launched. And I will come to that in just a second. But before that, what are the other policy instruments that other ministries have, have deployed, right? So we have the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. What they've done is they've, and since we are a federal structure, we cannot, as the central government, we cannot force the state governments to do something. But what we can do is to, you know, issue advisories to them. And what we've told them is that, you should really exempt, uh, you know, the road tax on electric vehicles. You should exempt battery operated vehicles from, you know, paying the registration fees in that particular state. Uh, uh, we have actually come up with a notification on sale of vehicles without batteries. So that's, that's a new notification which has been launched so that the consumer can actually understand that what differential in cost is actually being brought about by the battery itself. Because we also want to give, uh, you know, kind of an impetus to the battery swapping industry in India. So we've actually now, we actually now have a notification where it's not mandatory for a consumer to actually purchase an electric vehicle with a battery. They can actually produce, uh, uh, sorry, procure a battery, uh, you know, separately. Uh, we've also looked at, uh, MORT has also come up with the deregistration and scrapping of government old vehicles, which are old. And we are also considering the imposition of a green tax where vehicles older than eight years might be asked uh, you know, to pay a green tax. Then if you look at the measures which have been brought about by the Ministry of Finance, the goods and services tax, uh, which consumers are liable to pay. On electric vehicles, this rate was originally 12%, but in order to sort of boost the uptake, this was brought down from 12% uh, to 5%. Uh, the same tax on the EV chargers, which was earlier at 18%, was then brought down to 5%. Uh, then you were also given tax deductions on the interest paid on loans to purchase electric vehicles up to USD 1500. 
And if you are a private company or a government agency which is hiring electric buses for the transport of your employees or whosoever it might be, uh, you are now exempt from, you know, from paying tax on that. Uh, if you look at the Housing and Urban Affairs Ministry, and city planning, of course, is an integral concept. I have not touched upon it much. I, I, in fact, I haven't touched upon it in my presentation, but that, of course, is very integral to ushering any kind of uh, you know, mobility that we might have. So what we see is the amendments to the model building bylaws, which have been brought about by Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Now it's for states and urban local bodies to kind of, uh, you know, notify them and why these bylaws, why these changes have been brought so that there is provision in office buildings, in commercial buildings, in residential buildings to allow for installation of, you know, electric vehicle chargers by default. So, for example, our bylaws would state something like, okay, if your house is four floors and if you to make that house, you, man, you need to have a parking that's built. Similarly, now the bylaws actually say that you need to have provisions for, uh, you know, charging points for electric vehicles. Similarly, Ministry of Power has, you know, issued a number of notifications. Uh, they've actually defined what these electric vehicle components are, uh, you know, uh, so that there's a level playing field between EV manufacturers and manufacturers of, uh, you know, you know, uh, manufacture, other manufacturers, right? Uh, because earlier, before this whole EV concept came in, there was not a very clear definition. What exactly is an EV charger? What exactly is charging infrastructure? So I think that definition was very important so that you provide a level playing field for the people who are actually, or the companies rather, who are actually, uh, you know, sort of manufacturing these. Um, and the Ministry of Environment, in fact, has drafted a notification on battery waste management which is very important from a, for, for an urban mining perspective, because as your EVs go up, the you know, demand for batteries would also grow up. So there is a certain value extraction that you have to do from the batteries, which also you know, brings down, for, ultimately would bring down production costs and also uh, does away with the resource scarcity that we have in terms of you know, lithium and cobalt. Uh, in terms of what our role is as the National Institution for Transforming India, uh, or Niti Aayog, which is the uh, ministry that I represent over here. So we at Niti Aayog, we realize that because there are so many different ministries, and this would be a problem that uh, you know the, the, the participants of various other countries also might be facing, is that there, there's a lot of different agencies. You know, So the charging infrastructure, for us, it's Ministry of Power, which is looking at it. If it's manufacturing of batteries or vehicles, it's Department of Heavy Industries. If it's bylaws, it's Housing and Urban Agents, you know, Urban Development Ministry. So I think somewhere there was a need that there should be one agency which should bring together and galvanize the efforts of all, all of these different stakeholders. And that's where we created the National Mission on Transformative Mobility and Battery Storage. And we have actually been working with different states to actually help them come up with their EV policies. So by the way, India does not have a central EV policy, but it's actually the state governments which are, you know, coming up with their own EV policies. And as Niti Aayog, we've actually been helping them come up and draft these state policies. And so far, 22 governments have already, you know, come up with, 22 state governments have already come up with their policies. Uh, we help the states and union and our territories, you know, undertake capacity building exercises. We have frequent interactions with them, you know, we bring in. Uh, you know, best practices, we, we are working on model concessionaire agreements for deployment of electric buses to an operating expense model. Uh, you know, uh, we got the charging standards notified, uh, you know, we're running campaigns to encourage e-mobility uptake. And now we have actually formed 11 different committees to look at circular economy across a number of areas. And one of them, of course, is the recycling of batteries. And that, of course, is very important. Uh, you know, for the, uh, for the kind of EV uptake in India that is required. What we also have on uh, the sub so what we've done so far, or what I was talking about so far, are measures which are related to the demand side of things. But it's also important to look at, you know, the supply side of things. So India very recently launched a uh, production linked incentive schemes, I believe, across uh, you know 17 or 18 different sectors, whether it's telecom, pharmaceutical, automobiles, solar energy. The idea was that we want to bring in more manufacturers into the country and we want to encourage them to set up manufacturing units across area. And so we came up with something very unique. We said that we will have something known as the production linked incentive scheme, where whatever you produce and if you meet certain production targets, you will actually be given a monetary incentive to actually produce those number of units or that class of units. So what we have, uh, 
which pertains directly to EV is the PLI scheme for ACC battery storage, which is the advanced cell chemistry battery storage. And this scheme has a total outlay of about 2.5 billion USD. And what we want is that, you know, through a competitive bidding process, we will uh, actually select manufacturers who would then be required to set up uh, a minimum of, you know, five gigawatt hour capacity, uh, you know, uh, battery manufacturing units and ensure that there is at least a 60% value addition uh, within five years, uh, you know, from setting up your manufacturing units. And this kind of incentive will be paid out, you know, on the basis of your sales, energy efficiency, battery life cycle, and, you know, there's a number of other parameters which are there uh, in, in, in the bidding process and the scheme guidelines. And we expect that as a result of this, about 5.9 billion USD worth of direct investment is going to come in. And it's also going to save us about 33 billion USD in terms of, you know, uh, reduction of, uh, you know, oil import bill. Similarly, the other production linked incentive scheme, which was just launched a couple of months ago and which has, uh, which has uh, an outlay of about 3.5 billion USD, uh, is the scheme to incentivize uh, electric vehicle and fuel cell EV manufacturing or the auto and automobile components. So what we've done as a result of this, we've covered charging ports, drive trains, you know, electric vacuum pumps, compressors, flex fuel kits, hydrogen cell fuel kits, uh, and ICE engine vehicles, of course, uh, you know, some parts, but at least 90% of this subsidy is specifically encouraging uh, the production of electric vehicles in the country, which is, which is uh, you know, which is really interesting. Uh, what we also launched uh, is uh, something known as the vehicle scrapping policy. And what we've done is that now all old vehicles will have to pass a fitness test, you know, before they want re-registration. And what we've done is that while we have not directly taxed, you know, while we've not directly taxed such vehicles, you know, because that would have led to a lot of animosity from the traditional ICE industry or just the players, but we've, you know, spun it in a slightly different way. What we've said is that if you want to renew your license after 15 years, right, we've increased the amount of registration fee that you will have to pay for it. And similarly, if you're actually, you know, kind of deregistering your vehicle, which is older than 15 years, if you're getting it scrapped, right, then what we do is that we have told the vehicle manufacturers to give you a discount of 5% uh, on the total sale of the new vehicle that you are purchasing. And the registration fees will also be waived off on the purchase of this new vehicle. So there is an incentive and there is also a disincentive. And of course, this will go a long way in promoting the uptake of electric vehicles, but also in terms of reduction of emission and also giving, you know, providing the impetus for the, you know, evolution of a local scrap industry, uh, you know, vehicle scrapping industry in the country. As I said, at the central level, we've taken a number of measures to incentivize the demand side and the supply side. And this is applicable throughout the country. So, you, you know, you cannot have a state government saying that we have not received benefits because these schemes are applicable across the nation. But over and above this, what we see is certain very proactive states of India, which have announced incentives over and above what the central government already has to sort of offer them. So, for example, the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh, they've talked about, they've said that they will provide reimbursements on the state goods and services tax. They will provide a waiver on electricity duty for five years. They will provide you a financial incentive assistance or rather share 50% of your cost of fixed capital investment on EV manufacturing. Uh, similarly, let's say the state of Uttar Pradesh, which happens to be India's most populous state, they've announced a capital interest subsidy, infrastructure interest that subsidy, reimbursement of you know, the goods and services tax. So states are mostly coming up with measures which are supply side as, as they would be expected to. And as you can see on the map on your right, about 22 uh, of our states have actually announced their electric vehicle policies. Uh, and I think why states are also happy to do this is because they realize that all of them are anyway benefiting from the central assistance because, you know, the central assistance or the subsidies do not discriminate between states. So it's, it's for them. And we've been encouraging them that, you know, I mean, electric vehicles are going to be a big thing in India over the next few years. So you know, you should jump in to, you know, join in, you know, and we will provide you any help possible, whether it's training your EV policies, learning from the best practices, uh, so on and so forth. And just to end, just to leave you with 
uh, you know, a couple of pictures. If you actually come to India or if you actually come to Delhi, you would see that just from a couple of years before, there's a massive difference. You know, you would find charging infrastructure in any major market. Uh, you know, you would see it in housing societies. In fact, you would see, uh, you know, charging infrastructure installed outside people's houses. So it's something that's catching up on, you know, very quickly. And we've seen people coming up with, you know, rather, you know, unique solutions. So now there are agencies which have actually converted, uh, you know, the junction boxes of lampposts where you could actually connect and charge your, uh, you know, electric vehicle, which is the picture that you see on your, uh, you know, on your right picture is pink. So we've got really interesting solutions like that coming up. Uh, you know, in the country. And we expect that this will only grow further. But one of the challenges that we see is that uh, this, this development is also slightly haphazard with different agencies jumping in to do things that, uh, you know, uh, and not coordinating these efforts, which is why it's very important, uh, you know, to have coordinated efforts across the entire green mobility spectrum. And E2, and as you see, a scooter parked in the first picture, their electric two-wheeler sales, in fact, Ola Electric just launched uh, two variants of their, uh, you know, uh, electric scooter. And in 24 hours, uh, you know, they received 100,000 bookings. Uh, that's just in 24 hours. So, uh, I mean, imagine the kind of interest that, that there's there uh, for mobility, uh, which is electric um, in certain Indian cities as of now. And what we've also seen is the emergence of a lot of startups, uh, you know, Aether Energy, uh, you know, these are all startups. I mean, the first, uh, you know, eight uh, logos that you see up there are all startups, uh, which have actually cropped up and they're actually doing really well. And of course, there's a bigger manufacturers also, uh, which are producing their electric vehicles. Uh, so I think that's, that's from my end, a brief overview of, you know, the electric mobility ecosystem, um, you know, in, in India and what are the policy instruments uh, that we've been able to deploy so far. And, you know, going forward, of course, there are a number of challenges, but I think going forward, the key would be to integrate efforts across state level, urban local body level, and national level, uh, and also kind of integrate electric vehicles and shared mobility with the public transport network, because until and unless you have that planning, uh, you will only see, you know, development, which is kind of haphazard and which doesn't really serve the purpose of mobility, which is truly, uh, you know, sort of clean. So uh, from my end, uh, that is it.